previously on the Skip and Josh podcast. The only thing I remember from that show is as we were sitting in traffic on the way down, again, it was a really hot day and everyone had their windows rolled down and their sunroofs open. The uh, the car in front of us, there was a girl in the car in front of us. She stood up through the uh, through the sunroof of her car and flashed us. It was great. I have that. no I have no recollection of that, Josh. I sure, swear. Sure. The Skip and Josh podcast is on now. Hello. Hey, Skip. How are you? Great. What's happening? Uh, you know, same old stuff. It's yep. a weekend. I'm relaxed and uh, ready to uh, record another podcast. How's things with you? Great. Great. I mean, it's like uh, fall's coming. Winter's coming. Like the Game of Thrones, you know, fall's here, winter's coming, I feel. But, you know, um, I'd like to just wish you a happy anniversary. This is like the first episode of our year two. That's right. I completely forgot. Thank you very much, and happy anniversary to you as well. <laughs> so you know, um, we were we just um, were recently guests on the Semi Intellectual Musings podcast with uh, um, Matt Sanderson and Phil Primo, and you know they kind of referred to us a little bit as an old married couple, and so like just like a traditional old married couple, like you didn't remember our anniversary. So thanks. Right, and and uh, actually, what I what I it was a, it was a great experience being on their show. What I forgot to mention when I was on the show is when I talk to you about them, I refer to them as the smart guys. Yeah, yeah. You said to me, "When are we recording with those smart guys?" Right. So I mean, we had a, such a great time um, on their show, just talking about the tragically hip. It was like honestly, I had such a blast talking with them. So we decided to do like a little bit of a crossover and have them on our show and um, dig into some more or less sports and politics where our kind of shows kind of intersect. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Matt Sanderson and Phil Primo from the Semi-Intellectual Musings podcast. Hey, guys. Hey, thanks for having us on. Hey, guys. How's it going? Great, great. I mean, we had such a great time uh, talking about the hip. I mean, it was so amazing. Honestly, like, what a blast. And uh, now we're going to, like, dig into a little bit of sports. But um, before we do, like, can you, I mean, look, I'm an avid listener of your show. And, like, one thing that I've said, I've said it on our show and I've I've written about it on, like, social media is, like, the, the community of, like, indie podcasters that we've been able to connect with since we started doing this is just so phenomenal. And you guys are kind of, like, the first ones that, like, we kind of retweeted, tweeted, answered tweets. And, and then, you know, finally we really connected, you know, to, to record together, which was great. So um, I just love your show. And, I mean, I can't wait for every episode to come out. And, like, I, I feel like... Um, it's so different than everything else that I consume podcast wise, which is great. It's really unique. So like maybe you can tell our listeners a little bit about what your show's all about. First off, thanks for the kind words. <laughs> We're actually yeah. feeling kind of humbled looking at <laughs> yeah, each other well, like guiltily. <laughs> uh, yeah, so on so I man the Twitter. So I'm Phil. This is Phil's voice. Yeah. And uh, I man our Twitter account. So uh it's it's kind of funny how this all came about. So um you know, I think we're both, or I was at least uh, very active on the hashtag Potter and Family account uh, in the very beginning to try to, you know, tap into this indie podcast network. But then I wanted to find Canadian podcasts to connect with. And you were like, if you weren't the first, you were like the second one that I found on Twitter. So I actually found your show on Twitter. Um, and then, you know, subscribed, started listening to it and was like, wow, these guys are from Montreal, Toronto. So first of all, we're from out Ottawa or we record not far from Ottawa. So it's kind of like right in between. Yeah. Um, and I love the way that you approach sports conversationally. You know, it's not all about the scores. It's not all about the stats. It's about, you know, I think you guys have said it and we said it on the on our side of this uh, conversation, but it's about how sports affects you. And I really was uh, drawn to that. So I started retweeting and connecting with you guys. So it's great to finally come on and speak uh voices instead of uh you know 140 yeah. characters instead of shouting at our earbuds when we're listening to their show yeah yeah <laughs> like hey yeah, man yeah. come on <laughs> talk about this no i um like echo uh phil's sentiments there i as soon as he sent me the first link he's like oh check these guys out they're canadian they're doing a sports show and i listened to it and for me um like i'm an avid podcast listener i've listened to podcasts for like nine years or something like i go way back and and i I was looking for a general sports conversational show that wasn't so 
like insanely stat driven. Um, I know you've had that NFL guy who was like talking about the minutia of contracts on oh, there before. Man. Holy and that was moly. that was Neil. Yeah, I, yeah, it was Neil. Yeah, and that was great. Like I, I'm like, oh wow, because I can. I don't know. I, I like that sort of engagement at some sometimes, but um, I actually just like your guys' banter and and how it's almost like having two buddies who know way more about sports but aren't jerks about it. Basically, yeah. you, you guys <laughs> aren't jerks. Cool. Thank so. you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> No, it's interesting you say that, though, because while our show is basically it's just a phone conversation that we record, I mean, Skip and I would talk to each other even if we didn't have the show and we'd pretty much say exactly the same thing. But um, I must confess, I, I do consider myself a bit of a, a, a bit of a sports snob because uh, at work, anytime anyone is talking about sports, I don't really get involved in the conversation because I feel like I know way more about sports than anyone else. And I don't <laughs> want to talk about it with them because they're just not going to understand it at the level that I understand it. And I'm, I'm not necessarily right. Like they might know more about me, but I just feel like I'm always the smartest person in the room when it comes to sports. Except when you're with me, right? <laughs> Except when I'm with you, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I have a similar feeling about when people start talking about school or like research or sociology or anthropology. I just stay out of it because I think like they don't know what they're talking about. And then right. uh, I save what I'm going to say and I and I say it to Matt. And Matt just nods and he's like already there. Like, yeah, yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's so funny that you say sports snob as well. I literally wrote that down just before you said it. I'm like, you guys are not sports snobs. Um, at least that's not how it comes across on the well, podcast I mean, like, or is it that i'm yeah. a sports snob and that i just found two guys who are like me <laughs> we also both have degrees from harvard i have one he has two what a snob <laughs> so i think we got off on a tangent do you actually yeah, ever describe your show uh yeah. no so uh, our show <laughs> <laughs> welcome we to our show this yeah. is our show <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah our show semi-intellectual musings were weekly podcast that uh takes uh social sciences, humanities, and arts, and uh, we use those lenses to look at a variety of topics. So we've looked at literature, books, movies, um, cooking. Um, so really, we like to approach uh, the world around us through the social science, humanities, and arts lenses, and we want our listeners to feel like we're in a pub just having a conversation. Yeah, totally. Where notebooks are kind of optional and Honestly, we uh, we try not to take ourselves too seriously. But something that I've been thinking about the last little while is that when it comes to the research and the content for our show, that is taken pretty seriously. Like we put a lot of work in preparing for the show, but then we hope that it comes across in like an approachable manner on the actual show itself. Yeah, I know. Like, I mean, one thing is clear when you do listen to your show is there is a lot of pre work that goes involved that's involved. Like me and Josh don't even approach that actually we usually do no pre-work but or very little but i mean the the amount of research that goes into each and every one of your episodes is they're definitely noticeable i mean you know you start going through the history of whatever topic right so it's clear that like there's some work involved there yeah for sure thank you um and it, it's funny this coming on your show is a nice break for us because i just have like a blank sheet in front of me with four potential topics <laughs> and we're just going to have at right. it so this is actually a nice That's break great. for phil and i so, I mean, there's one story or storyline, I guess, that's been, you know, out, that's been in the news, like, basically this whole year, uh, this whole football season. And it started last year. And, I mean, it's this whole take a knee, Colin Kaepernick, uh, standing for the anthem stuff. And, I mean, Phil mentioned um, it on one of your episodes uh, that he really liked our intro to when this kind of kind of exploded a few weeks ago or maybe a month ago like me and josh kind of decided like we weren't really going to talk about it and i know it sounds weird because every sports talk show in the world or in north america is talking about you know um the nfl and the players not standing for the anthem and me and josh basically said no we're not going to do that because you know we want to talk about sports we want to talk about stuff we like to talk about we want to talk about what's interesting to us what's taught what's we want to talk about you know what something a little bit more positive I, I hate to say it but like and then when you guys approached us to like hey you want to do a crossover you want to do a I mean it seemed like the natural topic of of this whole anthem business was like sports and politics intersecting is where you know it, it seemed like the natural kind of starting point for our two shows to kind of have a little conversation right 
Yeah, what I really, uh, so I'm just going to kind of continue with what you were saying there, but what I really loved about that intro to that episode, and I don't remember exactly which episode it was now, but you said, um, you know, yes, there are politics in sports. Yes, it's there. But let's focus on the uh, personal experience with sport first. And yeah. sometimes, you know, you just need a distraction. So let's yeah. view sports as that distraction. And what I really yeah. liked about that is that that is one part of sport. One part of sport is that it's a distraction from your everyday kind of, I'm going to just call it like BS that goes on, right? Um, and you said something like, you know, you get home after a long day work, you don't want to think about money. You don't want to think about your work problems. You don't want to think about all the things that you should be doing. You just want to relax and watch a bunch of guys skate around or run around a field, right? Right. Yeah, so like I mean, I, yeah, okay, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry, no, no, you go ahead. Sorry, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 you go, you go, you go. Oh God, See, Canadian like, stand up. Honestly, like for me, like I kind of disagreed a bit with you guys. Actually, if that's okay, uh, if uh, <laughs> um, that's okay, but, thank you. <laughs> um, I like when I'm watching sports, I can't help but seeing the social and political uh, dimensions of it. Um, we might talk about concussions later, but like I can't watch UFC or boxing anymore. I can't really watch NFL and. Um, like I have a hard time hearing people talk about the NFL when they don't like acknowledge some of the political and social dimensions of it. So I don't know it, where I'm going with this, but it just sort of like I have a hard time separating um, sports mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. politics. I mean, look, I have a lot of opinions. Like what we didn't, we, you basically went through our whole lives on the on on your uh, on the first part of this episode. <laughs> but what you don't know about me is that I actually have a, a BA in poli sci. So, oh, okay. uh, yeah. So I I do like to talk about politics. I I am involved in politics. I have opinions, but like I kind of muted them. So you know, on my show, but like you like. We can definitely definitely get into it right now, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. And and I'll just say right off the top, like I as somebody who creates a show as well, um, with Phil here, um, I can respect that as well. Like knowing mm -hmm. what your audience is looking for and being able to separate your um, political views um, from your show if that's the direction you want to go. So I actually respect sure, that. Sure. So yeah. <laughs> So um, where do you want to start with Kaepernick? I mean, was, can yeah, I tell you something from a sports perspective? I love Kaepernick. He was yeah, like yeah. one of my favorite players in the league. I'm a huge 49ers fan. Me too. And yeah. like, I thought he got like a raw deal. And yeah. like basically they, before all the kneeling stuff, like he, they didn't use him properly. Like from, to, from a pure sports angle, they didn't use him properly. His team sucked. He started to look bad as a quarterback. And next thing you know, he's out and of he the league. One, right? <laughs> and he was one complete pass away from winning a, a Super Bowl. Yeah. He was one pass away from winning the Super Bowl. And now he's not in the NFL. And like, my God, I don't even want to, like, it's disgusting when you see some of the quarterbacks that are going to play this Sunday. And it's, this it's coming funny, Sunday. Like, he, playing for the 49ers with the legacy of quarterbacks that they've had, um, it's oh, almost yeah. like you're, that's quite a big standard to live up to, right? So it's mm -hmm, almost like right. he was setting up to to fail and um and i agree with uh, not using him correctly uh, the nfl has always had a problem with that um unlike our league up here in the cfl where you have much more mobile quarterbacks um down in the yeah. nfl they still have this old school idea that it ha they have to sit in the pocket and they have to sort of look down their options down the field and stuff so you are a hundred percent right and i've said it several times on our, on our show that whenever a mobile quarterback comes they don't know what to do they don't know what to do with these guys they they the offensive coordinators are like, oh, well, he's not a dropback passer. Like, he won't fit into our offense. Well, like, how about fitting your offense around him, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that, totally. That yeah. Or their occurs. Yeah. height as well. Like, they're they're not tall enough to be a quarterback in the <laughs> NFL. And But, I mean, that's why we have so many exciting quarterbacks up here in the CFL, right? Yeah, that's right. We got all the very, very talented players that just don't have the height or or physical requirements sometimes. Um, so I have some quotes about things that have been said about Colin, uh, cap. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. so, uh, he's not 100% committed. Uh, he's more concerned with activism. He's a distraction. He will only sign with the team. If he starts, he wants too much money. Uh, or even I'm concerned about his conditioning now that he is a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> some major stuff there. Right. But the thing about no, only signing a team, if he was going to start, that that might be true. I don't know. That that might be true. We don't know what we don't know what went on, but I mean, we do know that he wasn't signed by anybody and and quarterbacks in the league are dropping like flies and he's still not signed by anybody. So it's a bit weird, right? Yeah, it's weird that he hasn't got a chance in Green Bay, right? Yeah. 
Kaepernick and his lawyer are suing the league for collusion. And then just yesterday, um, the league has asked three different owners to hand over their cell phone records and email records to see if there has been any uh, communication regarding Kaepernick and not signing him. So, I mean, I don't know if anything's going to come from this investigation, but, uh, but I mean, to the naked eye, it does appear that yes, there is collusion because other quarterbacks have been signed with all these injuries that are not as good as Colin Kaepernick. But to prove that in a court of law, I don't know that someone could do that. From what I've read, I think proving collusion is really difficult. And I think as long as even if they did collude, which I do think they did, I not not all 30 owners, but I think there was some kind of maybe unwritten, unspoken collusion at, at very least, like people kind of agreed to like, we're just not going to sign him. But like, I don't know how you can prove it. You know, like, like you said, they're going to try to get phone records. I don't know if they'll find anything, but. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, I guess the big question that I have anyway is are professional sports teams like the NFL obligated to hire people who are available to play? I mean, like if I walked up there and said, you know, I can I can be a great uh, safety uh, and I and I, and I, you know, showed stats and I could play as a great safety, but no one hired me. Yeah. Would I be able to yeah. sue them for not hiring me? Yeah, because you're Canadian. They don't think you're a good enough football player or something like that. Right. Yeah. yeah like yeah. I'm used to playing with big balls and, you know, now yeah. I got to go to the NFL. See what I find. Sorry. What I find interesting about this collusion thing. I'm happy you brought this up because that's the word that keeps popping into my head about Colin Kaepernick is that they're colluding to keep him out of the league. And um effective collusion is always a handshake thing right if you leave a paper trail then you're doing something wrong right and what's interesting about seeing collusion in professional sports is you can actually quantifiably prove that colin kaepernick is a better quarterback than um some white boy from mississippi or whatever they they got playing on some random team you can actually compare their stats and and say at least there's a strong indication that this guy has more potential to be a more effective player for us, more effective asset, because that's honestly how they're looked at, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I went through I went through the beginning of the year, remember, Josh, like the list of really terrible quarterbacks that were starting on week one, and there yeah. was a lot of them. And yeah. and it's only gotten worse, right? Like just this week, Deshaun Watson of the Houston Texans got, is out for the season, and like Kaepernick's a perfect fit for that team. Perfect fit. Yet I, I've heard that this stiff Tom Savage is going to start this week, and like they already know he sucks. They tried him. They know right the team knows and i don't know like i i hate to beat a dead horse but like i i don't know like i i just don't think he's going to get signed by anyone and i think that's just the way it is you know you guys you guys brought up a great point about 90 seconds ago when you said is there an obligation for the nfl or any nfl team to sign him and there isn't it is a private organization i mean for example if ibm i'm just picking a company out of the top of my head wanted to hire the best I don't know, computer engineers, and there's a long list of computer engineers. There could be the best computer engineer on the planet, but for some reason, IBM doesn't want to hire that person. They don't have to. They're not obligated to. I don't think it's illegal. Mm. And it's also, oh, sorry. It's also interesting that you can't take a one-off, like when you when you go to a court of law and you're trying to prove like an affirmative action case, essentially, like what you're describing there, like say they didn't pick um, people of color who are just as qualified to be engineers, um, those like the paper trail you need to prove that goes back like almost like decades um, to just to prove that very obvious sort of form of collusion, right? So yeah, I see your point there for sure. You know, Phil, you mentioned um, um, he's a distraction. This is one of the buzzwords that's going around, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but what do you guys think about this? Like, don't you think that um, the president tweeting that players should be fired is a distraction? Absolutely. Well, how about yeah. how about owners owners of the teams coming out and saying one owner saying um, we're not going to let the inmates run the prison. Exactly. Oh, yeah, that was right. the owner of the Texans, right? That yeah. was the owner of the Texans that said we're not going to let the inmates run the prison. And Jerry Jones of the 49ers said anybody who kneels is not going to play. Right. Right. Two weeks after he kneeled. Right. Which is, you know, that's a whole other story. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. You know, so so like. Don't you think that these are distractions? Like the distractions are already there, right? <laughs> like it's not going to change, right? So I think the whole like uh, hashtag distraction is like complete. It's just an excuse, really. Yeah, and I find it really funny that you know, um, you know, I kind of opened with describing your show as wanting to use sports as distraction, 
So like, what are mm-hmm. we distract? Like, so now there's a distraction of the distraction. Like the distraction isn't good enough. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, semiotically speaking, of course. Um, so, so, yeah. so it's not about how good uh, Kaepernick is because we know he can play amongst some of the best quarterbacks or, you know, some of the, at least the oh. middle tier quarterbacks. Yeah, he's like top 50 yeah. and top yeah. 20. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then it becomes something else, right? And it becomes something that's racialized or something that's wanting to be anti-political or something about maybe his politics. So I think, you know, proving collusion on that front is more about just proving how how biased the NFL is. But we don't need Kaepernick to know that. They keep hiring right. uh, players and re-signing their contracts of players who have been found guilty of abuse at home, like, you know, beating their wives and stuff. So, like, we know that the NFL is biased. We know that um, they have their own kind of agenda. Yeah, then they privilege certain types of crimes, basically. Like, if you beat a woman, apparently you could still uh, play in the league. And it's interesting, when they talk about distractions, it's almost like if they keep talking about the distraction, all you can notice is the distraction, right? So, like, maybe this could all just sort of be settled if somebody just gave them a freaking job, right? And if people, like, honestly don't care if uh, athletes are kneeling, then, like, stop talking about it. Like, and just move on. But when you keep hyper-focusing on it and calling it a distraction, that's all people can focus on. Yeah. I don't know if you guys remember a few years ago, there was um, a player in NCAA college football. His name is Michael Sam, who came out, who came out and, and said he was gay. And um, there was, there was questions around whether any NFL team would draft him because they didn't want the distraction of having him around and having reporters around and asking a million questions that had nothing to do with football. In the end, he did get drafted. And um, I don't think he actually ever played a game in the NFL. And then he, I think, played one game in the CFL. And as it turned out, I don't think he was good enough to play. And that's the reason he doesn't play anymore. Um, but I mean, there's another example of a distraction. So, so NFL teams, they want to make sure that there are no outside distractions so they can focus on football literally 24 seven. I mean, if you ever met a football coach or a football general manager, it's all they think about 24 seven. They don't have a life. Some of them sleep at the stadium. Um, but I'm not saying that this is excuses their behavior no, no, by, by no. any means, but it's just there's another example of how, you know, we don't want this guy in the team because it's going to be a distraction. And when Michael Sam was being um, sort of scouted and uh, like rumored that he was going to go in the first round, um, I remember the narrative around him was that his teammates all accepted him and the coaching staff all accepted him. And he's actually a really good leader almost because of his homosexuality. And it's like, they had to almost like justify that this guy was capable despite being gay um, so that teams in the NFL would even consider having him on there. And then as soon as the teams were approached for comment, like, will you draft this guy? They're like, Ooh, I don't know if our fan base is going to really be yeah. okay with this. So they'd displace like the blame onto their fans and calling their fans a bunch of homophobes. And it's like, no, just draft this guy and let's move on and see if he can play. Like, I don't know. It, it, well, it just you, strikes me as weird. I don't know. You use the key word there, like fan base, right? So that's kind of like getting onto this like big elephant in the room or elephant in the, I don't know, we're not in the same room, so I guess there can't <laughs> be really an elephant in the room. <laughs> but Like this thing that we haven't talked about yet, which is like Kaepernick's message, which is completely being misconstrued because I think the big portion of the fan base of the NFL just doesn't care. And then and they and they're they're just gobbling up what's being fed to them, you know? Like I, I wish someone could just take some of these fans and shake them and say, Do you understand that kneel they're not kneeling because they're protesting the anthem? They're protesting a cause, right? It's yeah. not the anthem that they're protesting. Like it's so frustrating. Every time I see the word anthem and protest together, it's so frustrating. And yeah. Phil, you know, you brought it up in like your little rundown, like I started following Colin Kaepernick on social media before he was a starter for the 49ers. But when he was yeah. a uh, he, when he was the backup, right? Cuz I'm a big fan of that team. I knew who this guy was since day 1, right? And he has been involved in social causes since the first day he walked into the National Football League. Oh, seriously? Before, I had no idea. Since before yeah. anybody knew who the hell this guy was. He works with kids every week. He has camps with kids, summer camps. He right now he, he I mean his causes are racially 
influence. He, he, he goes into black communities to try to teach kids about, you know, their rights and, and, you know, like basically like mentoring them. But like, that's what he's about. That's what he's always been about. Nothing's changed. He's just brought his message to a bigger audience. You know, now that he became more famous and more known, he, he wanted to get his message out there, you know, and now he's being penalized for it, which kind of sucks. He sounds like, um, honestly, it just popped in my head, but he sounds like an educator. Like what a lot of his stuff does is like educating yes. the masses on. And it's interesting, like this is tied to, it, it's deeply rooted in the NFL, but basically there is um, a stereotype and a prejudice against African-American quarterbacks because the assumption is that African-Americans aren't intelligent enough to um, play the position. It's something that I would talk about in my tutorial groups a little bit. And this is one of the reasons mm -hmm. why um, Warren Moon ended up in the CFL and he played for six seasons I believe with the Eskimos and won five Grey Cups which is crazy right. and yeah. um, a lot of the rumblings and maybe occasional comments in the media would hint at the assumption that um, African Americans aren't intelligent enough to play the position so mm. I think there's this subtlety with Kaepernick because he challenges that perception because he's brilliant right and he's an educator he's very smart well. guy yeah and he's political yeah. But those things come yeah. first. The smarts come before the politics, right? It's funny because this whole thing about like, you know, like the fam the most famous quote ever about like, you, you guys remember this quarterback, Doug Williams? He was a quarterback for the Redskins one year when they won the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah, totally. I do. So yeah. he was the first, he was the first black starting quarterback to ever yeah. win the Super Bowl. It was right. in the 80s. And uh, then, you know, of course you get like the scrum of media in the press conferences before the Super Bowl and you get reporters that are not following, you know, the, the most classic quote ever is you know, a reporter holds up his mic to Doug Williams. is like, what's it like being a black quarterback in the NFL? And he's like, well, I've oh. always been a black quarterback, you know, like what he's <laughs> like, you know, like so <laughs> that, that's just like the all time classic. As much as the, the, the black quarterbacks have kind of established themselves in the league, like there's been so many now that it shouldn't be a big deal. It still kind of is right. I mean, yeah. And yeah, these assumptions, uh, they take a long time to change, like culture or social organization. That takes a long time to change. You can't just sort of like overnight it, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's going to persist for a while. And usually, and this is the last point on this little thing, but um, usually African-American uh, professional athletes are praised for their physicality, right? So when you think about Michael Vick, uh, he yeah. revolutionized the quarterback position because he was just like a physical specimen. Right. And right. so they right. get praise for the physicality, but their intelligence is underplayed. And I just wanted to sort of you throw are. that out there because I think it's an important point. It's a hundred percent. It's a hundred percent true. One well, of the most hypocritical things is uh, every college football player before they enter the NFL, they go through what, what the NFL calls a combine where right. they put them yeah. through the ringer. They make them run. They make them jump. They make them do all these these drills, you know, so they can test them on their speed and their agility and everything like that. One of the things they do at this combine is they give them a written test. And I'm not even sure why they give them the written test because a lot of the players, whatever position you're talking about, a lot of the players – don't do well on this written test, but they still get drafted in the first round. So I'm not even right. sure why they give them this written test. It's so hypocritical. Mm. Right. That's it's the just, wonder lick, right? The yeah. wonder lick test is called. Yeah. yeah exactly. And like the yeah. visual of seeing like a, a lot of African-American um, uh, athletes um, going through a combine with a bunch of white um, owners of the teams kind of judging them off on the side. There's some symbolism there that is pretty disturbing yeah. if you think about it. So. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, I just want to bring up um, a couple events in history that are somewhat similar to what we see going on with Kaepernick. Um, and two of them in particular that I want to draw attention to revolve around the events uh, of Ferguson, so Tavon, um, Trayvon Martin shooting. So um, the St. Louis Rams around 2012 um, um, walked out onto the field uh, in a game before the Oakland Raiders. And uh, they put up their, their, their hands. So they raised their hands during the anthem. Um, and no one kind of got in trouble for that. But that's the NFL. But going to the NBA, also in protest to the Trayvon Martin shooting, was the Miami Heat, who put on their hoodies and stood with their hands in their pockets during the anthem. Right. LeBron James, uh, who was a member of the Heat during that time, tweeted a picture of the Miami players doing that. Um, and yet, like we don't see the sort of fallout that we've seen with Kaepernick around these sorts of part of the reason why is this whole Kaepernick thing. I mean, I don't know if it was week four or five, whatever it was, 
it was quieting down. Like you, you could see every week there were less and less players that were protesting. Yeah. And then it only blew up because the president of the United States opened his big mouth and said something, <laughs> oh, and yeah, then it yeah. became a big deal. Yeah, it's kind of got so a little now, mouth, what, yeah. everything that anyone is talking about now, it's not even about Kaepernick anymore. It's something completely different. And so, but everyone still uses Kaepernick's name because he was the one who was the first one to do it and whatever. But the reason that players are standing and protesting now is not even the same reason that Kaepernick stood and protested. It's completely different. But, you know, you, you, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the president, Josh, because you were asking, Phil, like, w- w- why in 2012 and in 2000, uh, like, was it OK to, like, kind of protest? And now it's not. And it's because it's it's the United States is not the same in 2012 as it is now because yeah. of who's in charge. Right. And the person in charge has kind of um, brought a lot of um, maybe people out of the woodwork who were a little bit not going to say how they really feel about things. And now they're like, no, if he thinks uh, that's okay, then I'm okay to say it also. Right. Yeah. And like, we can think back like even further in history to like um, the late sixties, early seventies with Ali, Muhammad Ali, who. Oh, I, I wrote was, that down also. I was, was going to bring that up. Oh, well, okay. Well, <laughs> we're thinking alike already. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, he, like, you know, so he refused to be drafted. Uh, he was, right you know, convicted of draft evasion. He was sentenced. I think he was fined. Um, but yeah. yet he continued his sport career and his politics grew stronger because of it almost. Like, yeah. so being being penalized by the state allowed Ali to have even a bigger platform. But we don't necessarily see that with Kaepernick. Like, mm. you know, he's being penalized I by think... the NFL. And I feel yeah. like, yes, there's attention being drawn to it, but it's not Kaepernick's voice. It's voices of people like Dave Zirin. It's boy. It's voices of people like Trump. It's everyone else is talking for and on behalf of Kaepernick. Yeah, but uh, you know what? I wonder if this is going to look different in ten, twenty, maybe fifty years from now, yeah. and we're going to look it back will. at this in a completely different way. And and I, I I know this is like a huge stretch, right? This is like sorry if it's like totally weird, but like no, go for it. Think back to like the beginning of the civil rights movement, right? Right. Rosa yeah, Parks. Yeah. Rosa Parks sat on that bus and said, I'm not going to give up my seat for a white man. And I don't know what was said at the time. I wasn't alive and, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, you can imagine newspapers in the South basically um, tearing her apart, right? Like, who are these people? Like, it was, you can imagine that, like, she was portrayed as the villain. And now, of course, in she's a hero. And I think that eventually... Uh, Kaepernick is going to be seen that way. Yeah, totally. And he's going to he's yeah. going to be identified. There's a chance that he could be identified at a start as the start of a huge movement. You know, but For we're sure. just not seeing it yet. We don't see it yet. You know, and like it's, it, it, we're, we're not there yet. Yeah. So it's interesting. Like, so Ali in the '60s and into the '70s, he would organize these forums with other African American athletes, big names, and talk about ways to organize themselves and strategize about ways to like engage with the media. So I think that mm-hmm. is the thing that's missing with Colin Kaepernick. He's trying to establish that, but everybody's yeah. so afraid. And that kind of connects, like we were talking about the NBA. Why is it different in the NBA? I think the thing like people don't talk about much is that in the NFL, there is no guaranteed contracts. Like you can yeah, essentially be huge. cut at any time. So yeah. like there is, they are heavily disincentivized to speak out because you can just sort of say, oh, you tweaked your knee or something in practice so long to your yeah. contract, right? But in the NBA, it's more like hockey where you have guaranteed contracts. And um, also, like, culturally in the NBA, the players seem to drive that league a lot more, right? They're a lot more marketable than um, NFLers yeah. with helmets on and or hockey players with helmets on. Well, know? that's why you get a guy like LeBron James, who's basically, like, one of the most powerful athletes in the world when it comes to, like, a social voice. Like, if he says something, people listen, right? Yeah. And, and in the know, world too, because the NBA in the is world one too. of the only yeah. North American sports leagues that's truly international. You know, you know, he's not afraid to tweet that the president is a moron or whatever he wrote. I forget exactly the words. Um, he's not afraid to tweet about whatever he thinks is just, right? But I think you're right. It needs to maybe go a step further and like get a little organized, right? Maybe. I think so. I think that's the missing component. That's why, as Phil says, you're not hearing from Colin Kaepernick. Um, himself there's other people sort of almost speaking on behalf of him and uh, you don't want that because then your political message gets distorted yeah right right the skip and josh podcast is back
So, um, so okay, completely shifting gears. Um, we were talking a little bit before we hit record. Um, one of you has a kid who plays in youth sports. It's something that I'm, I have um, a four-month-old, Violet. She's going to be the first Major League Baseball player. I'm just letting you know now. She'll play third base. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But uh, Is she going to play for the Jays? Uh, yes, yeah, she or? is. Actually, you know funny thing about Violet? Like, I wear my Blue Jays hat all the time because of all my concussions, basically. <laughs> um, but she associates the top of my head with the Blue Jays logo. So I, when That's I great. take off my hat, she looks at me like <laughs> yeah. puzzled. And then when I put it back on, she's like, oh, the top of Dad's head went back. <laughs> oh my god! So, that's great. Yeah, so, can we talk about some of the politics uh, of youth sports? Uh, some of the experiences uh, you guys have had, like, yeah, get into that a little bit. Sure, I'd love to. I mean, um, look, my kids are older than yours. <laughs> you have yeah. a newborn. Yeah. Uh, my son's sixteen. My daughter's fourteen. So I've lived through um, from my son played hockey from the time he was five to the time he was fifteen. He just stopped playing this year. He decided like. That was it for him in hockey. He's doing something else now. But, um, and my daughter has done organized sports, but, you know, unfortunately, like, you're not going to be so happy with me, Matt, but, he, you know, she did, like, what I would call, like, she's drawn to, like, the more girly sports, you know? So she <laughs> did, uh, you know, it's sad, but, you know, like, she, she, she never wanted to play soccer or, like, there's plenty of girls playing soccer, you know? Like, she never wanted to play soccer or, or baseball or there's tons of girls playing hockey. She doesn't want to do that. So she did gymnastics and she did cheer and um, now she just does dance, which is, believe it or not, a sport. Yeah, but, oh, for sure. Um, I totally see yeah. those as legitimate pursuits, for sure. Yeah. And, like, yeah. I don't agree. Like, obviously, they're, like, girlier, right? Like, figure skating Yeah, well, whatever. I mean, she was but drawn like, to that because but the femininity of it, you know? Yeah, yeah they're still sports. But, yeah. like, they're very artistic in, in a way. And there's makeup mm-hmm. and there's costumes. So, like, she's drawn to that, too. But, you know, my son played minor hockey uh, here in, in the West Island of Quebec, you know, for his whole life. And, oh, God, I have tons of stories. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, there's so much politics within the organizations, uh, the parents. And, you look, know, I was very heavily involved with all his teams. So I was never a coach, but I was a team manager for a lot of years. And I could tell you that I helped the coaches pick the teams because, you know, I knew all the players just as much as them. And, and we used to pick based on the parents. You know, mm. we don't want that kid because we don't want that oh, parent seriously? on our team. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so it wasn't the fact that I couldn't skate forward that I didn't make the hockey team? This is this is not like double letter hockey. This is single letter hockey. So, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, he did play double letter hockey like at, for yeah. a time. And then eventually, like, he was always the smallest kid. So it was tough on him because he was little. So he, he ended up in the single letters, which is there's no more house league anymore here in Quebec, right? Because all the cities have so many kids playing that you, you th- there's like a organized single letter, you know, dollar, you know, our town has, has single letter teams versus the, all the towns next door. And, you know, it's, it, there's a league of single letter hockey. So, I mean, we used it's, to pick the players and say, yeah, that kid's really good, but I don't know. I can't deal with that dad for a whole season, or I can't deal with that mom for a whole season. Like, and, and, and that was a definite consideration when picking players. Yeah, and it's interesting. Like when I played minor hockey, and I only played—I was a house player, legit house player. And um, mm-hmm. but in my hometown of Surrey, we only had two ice surfaces, right? Actually, okay. three in total. Um, so there was a three-year waiting list to play house hockey. <laughs> um, wow. So like, I started my first year of hockey. I was like thirteen, um, and so I was like developmentally in like a hockey sense, I was not making the rep team, right? Um, right. But I think like just like what you said, with it's about the parents. I think also it's um, a class issue as well, like a socioeconomic issue, because there was a lot of guys that I would play with who were like the best player on our team. They could easily be like a legit rep player, um, AAA kind of player, um, yeah. but their family just simply couldn't afford all the travel and all the equipment yep, and the additional um, camps that you have to go to and stuff. So I wonder if we can talk about sort of the the socioeconomic stuff in, in organized youth sports a bit. Well, hockey definitely here in this province, and I'm sure it's the same in Ontario, it's big business, right? Even at the youth level. So it's a 12-month sport. You yeah, play yeah, all year, yeah. right? Which is sad, right? I remember when I was a kid, I, I, you know, you do one sport, you do another sport. But now, if you want to play hockey, you got to play all year round. You can't do anything else, right? Yeah. If you want to be good at hockey, you got to do it all year. And you got to play during the year, and then you got to play for a spring league team, and then you got to do summer hockey, and then you got to go back in the in the, the fall and, and start your season over for your town. And... It's a grind, you know, like, honestly, it's a grind. And I was sure that my son was going to tell me when he hit peewee age that he didn't want to play hockey anymore. Not that, and he was a damn good player, let me tell you. Yeah. But yeah. I, I could see that it wasn't as much fun anymore. Yeah, he's burning and, out, right? 
Yeah. And, yeah. and, and I told him at one point, I was like, I told him when he was little, when he was in, after he finished Adam hockey, uh, his last year of Adam hockey. And I said, you know, Matthew, if you don't want to play hockey next year, you don't have to play hockey. Mm. And, and, um, and he looked at me like puzzled. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I was like, I'm just saying like, just because you've played hockey every year, doesn't mean that next year it has to continue. If you want to do another sport, if we want to go skiing, if you want to play basketball, if you want to like, if you want to do swimming, if anything, you don't want to do something else, you can do it. You don't automatically have to say I'm graduating to the next level of hockey just because that's the way it goes. And he was like, oh, I understand, I understand, but I want to play hockey next year. And he did. And he did play for two more years after that. And then um, actually for four more years after that, sorry. And then uh, just last year, he was like, okay, Matthew, I'm going to sign you up for hockey this year. He's about to start midget hockey, midget level. And he's like, you know what? I think I'm done with hockey. And I was like, I was cool with it. You know, honestly, yeah, totally. I yeah, was well, cool with it. My wife, my wife, <laughs> yeah, my wife, who wasn't as into it. I mean, I'm the one that always took him all the time, went to all the games. And unfortunately, when you have two kids, you tend to like, one parent goes with one and one goes with the other. Yeah, so totally. she tended to go to my daughter, driving my daughter everywhere she had to go. And I would drive him everywhere you had to go. That's just a sad reality. But she was like, oh my God, he's not going to play hockey this year. She was so sad. And I was like, why are you so sad about it? She goes, it's such a big part of his life. I'm like, yeah, you know, but he'll find something else. <laughs> you know? So like, yeah. so one sort of like partying uh, tip that I had that I heard a lot of professional athletes talk about, they, none of them played just one sport. If you want your kid right. to move ahead in any one particular sport, get them to play a multitude of sports. This isolating on one sport and playing it 12 months a year is not going to amount to anything. So I read that too, head. but there's so much pressure on the kids in hockey when it comes to tryout season, which is like August, September. And it's like, there's a lot of pressure on them. I used to feel so, I used to feel so bad for my son when he would go through tryouts and you go through the tryout and then you wait and you wait after the practice, you wait in the room and then they call your name and then they tell you if you made it to the next then if they call you outside the dressing room and they sit, tell you like if you made it to the next level or if like the next round of cuts or if you're or if that was it right and man it, there was a lot of pressure on them you know it's unbelievable so um i was a double letters player uh, and i was a goalie growing up wow and that, <laughs> i know so, it's so cool eh? so this <laughs> So what you're what you're saying, like you know, being called in or out of the the dressing room if you're going to make it or not, is bringing back so many memories. So they do it. So they mess with your head. Like you're eight, nine, ten, twelve, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And they totally ex like I'm going to swear here. They totally f with you. So I remember sitting in there. At, so like after you know four weeks of showing them your skills and your you know you're playing some uh pickup games and you're competing against in my case like uh, i think we were eight or nine goalies competing for oh maybe God. four spots and yeah. um you know you're sitting around in the room and they always put all the goalies together right so that you can look at your enemy like right in the eye yeah yeah totally. and then uh so and then they'll say okay everyone wait here after you're done getting changed and we're going to call your name but you don't know if if you leave the room if you're being picked or not Right. And you're not supposed to and you can't go back to talk to the other ones to tell them like, oh, if they call your name, like you're cut. So sometimes yeah. it would be they call your name out of the room, you're cut. So basically like handshake, goodbye, you're gone. Or sometimes they call you out of the room and send you to another room. And then someone else would say, OK, you made it to the next level. Like a holding cell. It, it was it was the craziest <laughs> experience of my life. But what I retained the most from that is um, so I, I, I made it a couple times and then I got cut. And the last time I got cut. Um, I walked out and one of the other parents said, well, what do you mean they cut you? Like your stats and your performance have been just spectacular. Like there's no, like hands down, you should have been picked. And then I will always remember another parent said, it's the politics behind it. He doesn't have parents who can drive him to the games. So they, they yeah. like, yeah. so they thought, well, you know, if we take him on, is he going to be able to make it to all the games? And yeah. I wouldn't like, yeah. Or is it going to be a burden to the team? Exactly. A distraction, right? Yeah, to, a distraction yeah, yeah. to the team. Yeah. I've seen many cases like that where even worse situations where it's like you didn't make it. Be Well, one kid made it because his dad's going to be one of the coaches. Well, yeah. shouldn't they decide the coaches yeah. after they make the team? Right? Like I never got that. Yeah. I, I can honestly yeah. remember yeah. the first and last name of like at least five guys who were in the exact same situation as Phil, whether it was a uh, socioeconomic thing or a family situation where they didn't make the team because uh, they just weren't able to get there. Yeah. Well, look, so, so Matt, like, what do you, what do you, how are you going to get Violet into baseball? 
um, well, I'm going to, there's interesting stuff going on in female baseball right now. So this is maybe the, the thing I'll leave you guys with, but, um, I know time, I believe has done an article on it and there was the women's world series that just happened, um, over in the summer. It's an international women's baseball tournament. So one of the politics of, of baseball and gender is that a lot of girls are funneled into softball and it's a completely different sport. And I think, um, there's no reason why women can't play professional baseball, um, if not make the major leagues as well. So, like, honestly, I'm just going to indoctrinate her with the Blue Jays, unfortunately. Um, and uh, hopefully it just sort of sticks. I already got the top of the head thing working, so we're getting there. <laughs> Josh, Josh, did you watch that TV show uh, on Fox? Um, what was it called? It was called Pitch, Pitch yes. Yeah. Pitch. Actually, it was a great show. It only lasted one season. Yeah, it was, yeah. I was upset that they canceled it, but it was about... Um, a female who makes the team and she's a pitcher and yeah. uh it was very well done actually yeah. I'm, I'm zach morris was that, the catcher uh, you know <laughs> who was sorry? zach morris is that is that what his name was i forget oh, oh forget no the kid his... from saved by the bell he was yeah. the catcher yeah totally <laughs> oh, <laughs> they just God. threw a beard on him <laughs> <laughs> i forget i forget his name so i'll take your word for it mark paul glosser yeah <laughs> Just to finish up on your daughter, if she's ever able to hit a hundred mile an hour fastball, and then she'll she'll make the majors. Yeah, no, I'm thinking utility infielder because I was always a terrible hitter. Nobody ever taught me how, okay. <laughs> but I'm trying to make her ambidextrous <laughs> right now. That's my first strategy. Switch hitter. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, let, let's tell, let me tell you, like when my son was like uh, two years old, he carried around like a, this plastic baseball bat everywhere he went. Right, everywhere he went, he had this bat in his hand. And then I remember still with like going in my backyard with Josh. And pitching him like a ball underhand with this bat. And Josh is like, no, no, we got to make him into a left-handed bat. <laughs> <laughs> so like, awesome. He, we, we taught him how to bat left-handed right from the, the same, start, yeah. right? Yeah, no, no, I know uh, yeah, that. Even though you're closer he's... to first base, um, there's yeah. less of you out there. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm, I'm on board with that as well. <laughs> but actually, what, what they do find in the province of Quebec and in Ontario... Um, there is well i mean this is it goes for a few things like golf is obviously much more popular and i know matt you're a big golfer right yeah totally. so um there is a much higher percentage of left-handed golfers in quebec and ontario as opposed to everywhere else in the world and it's because of hockey dude i totally <laughs> yeah, knew that i used yeah. to use that line to sell golf clubs at nevada bobs back in surrey <laughs> yeah it's because of hockey yeah, yeah and and the same thing happens um with youth kids in baseball because my son started to play baseball believe it or not, when he was 15 years old, not having no clue how to play baseball. He's like, sign me up for baseball. <laughs> so like he played baseball these last two summers. And of course he batted left-handed and there's a lot more left-handed batters than they're normally I was used to seeing. And it's yeah. mostly because a lot of the kids play hockey and they shoot left and, and oh, that's yeah. just like the way it goes. Yeah. It's pretty weird. Even though like they're all righties, like they write with their right hand and everything. So yeah. Like Phil yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's my setup dude. Yeah. But that's because I was yeah. a goalie. Uh, so I would catch with my left and then hold my stick with my right. And then, right, you okay. know, I just adopted that for my oh. golf swing, my baseball swing and everything else. Yeah, your so. top hand is your right, right hand. Yeah. 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 If you look at the back of the old uh, $5 bill, there's a bunch of kids playing hockey on a pond. And I believe all of them are shooting left. Only it, you would show it, find oh, that. Wow. That is amazing, oh, wow. Josh. That's I awesome. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for a fiver right now. <laughs> It's it's I, I don't know if the new five has it. I think it's the old five only. Yeah, but I know that I know that picture that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the hockey sweater thing. Yeah. yeah. So guys, I think we'll probably wrap it up. Maybe we'll have you back. I know there's some other topics that we wanted to delve into. Oh, you trust me, we're coming back on. Yeah. <laughs> you can't get rid of us now. We're just man. gonna invite ourselves back. Yeah. Now we have yeah. your Skype ID. I know <laughs> I know concussions in sports is like a huge thing for you, Matt. So yeah. I think maybe we can do a whole episode on that, maybe another time, right? That'd be cool. Yeah, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. Actually. So maybe Thank um I mean, I'm going to ask, sorry, Matt, but I'm going to ask Phil because I know he's more of the social media guy. Maybe you, you can uh, tell everybody, you know, how they can reach you, how they could find you and all that good stuff. Yeah, we're on Twitter at the underscore S-I-M underscore P-O-D. Uh, we're on Facebook at The Simpod. You can send Matt and, and or I an email at semi-intellectual at gmail.com. Our website, including the archives to the show, is thesim.podbean.com. Dot com and we're on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Radio FM, all the we're everywhere on the internet under semi intellectual musings. So you can just search for us, plug us in. Um, and we're starting well, we've started for a little while now, but we have this uh, kind of neat it's not a full segment, it's kind of like a half segment called patio sessions. So we release those kind of in between our big long, long winded research uh, episodes. 
Um, and those are all on our archives. Uh, but we invite people who want just a snippet, kind of like a 15, 20 minute of yeah, us talking, a, a little yeah. taste if you want to see what we're about to check out some of the patio sessions. Yeah, I really enjoyed the patio sessions. They were cool. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. All right, guys. Well, thanks for coming on. And um, that was a blast. Thanks yeah, for having us on. We had so much fun, guys. <laughs> like, thanks for joining us on our show. Yeah, yeah thank you very much for having time. us. All right. So uh, before we sign off, remember, you can listen and subscribe to new and archived episodes of the Skip and Josh podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or, you know, basically the podcast app of your choice. You know, anywhere you find podcasts, you know, just type in Skip and Josh and you'll find us. Um, if you would like to send us an email, we would love to hear from you. Skip and Josh show at gmail.com. Twitter is always great at Skip and Josh, or you can also like and follow our Facebook page. And um, as always, everything that I just said, all the links I just mentioned are on our website, skipandjosh.com. Awesome. Love it. All right. Talk to you next time, Josh. Have a good night. The Skip and Josh podcast is over now. Don't worry. There'll be another episode soon.